Hey Tony. Morning church. Morning. Good to see everybody. Uh, we're going to continue with our series on life's challenges and today we are going to be dealing with the challenge of guilt. I heard a story a while ago now about a 16 year old girl who was getting ready for her first big date and the doorbell rang and the parents answered the door and there at the, go the door stood this guy who was probably around 20 years, 21 years old. He had very long hair, his body was covered in tattoos and when there wasn't a tattoo there was piercings. And so her parents became a little bit nervous about this and they pulled the little daughter to the side and said, Darling, we are a little concerned about this date of yours. And she says, well, why, Mum? Why, Dad? He said, well, we're all concerned that he might not be very nice. And she looked at him and said, if he wasn't very nice, would he be doing 5,000 hours community service? <laughs> Our world is full of people who are quick to make judgments and uh, accusation is, a, is a, a skill that most of us have mastered very, very well. And since... Everybody in this room has got a, a closet full of regrets. There's never going to be a shortage of accusers around because we've all been there, haven't we, on that, what they call the, the guilt trip. And we're motivated and pushed along the way by our accusers. But the problem with the guilt trip, it's a dead end. It's never how God intended us to live. We've looked at this a few times over the past few weeks, but when God made man and woman, we read that they initially lived naked and the Bible says they didn't feel any shame. And so you need to understand that shame is not a part of how we were designed to live by God. It's not a part of it. It wasn't his ideal for us. But as soon as sin entered into the human story, all of a sudden the spirit of accusation followed and we started to pointing the fingers at each other. We see that with Adam and Eve at the very beginning, don't we? Oh, it was the woman you put me here with, God. It was your fault. Oh, it was Satan's fault. And we start to point the fingers at each other. Now, the only way I know that we can stop taking the guilt trip is to start following Jesus because he's the only one that I know that can silence even your worst accusers. A scripture reading that Tony just kindly read from us and John 8 to 11 is very popular uh, scripture reading. People know it very, very well. The, this woman is allegedly caught in the act of adultery. And that's what we're going to focus a little bit on. But before we get there, if God doesn't want us living with shame, then who does? Because we've all been there. Some people have become experts at shaming us with accusations because maybe we hate to admit this, don't we? Husbands and wives and mothers and fathers. The shame is a very powerful way to manipulate people. And so we know how to shame each other, but the truth of the matter is we often become experts at shaming ourselves. Nobody puts shame on me more than the shame I heap upon myself at times. But I want you to know that behind all the guilt and all the shame stands Satan. The accuser of the brethren who accuses them day and night. In other words, Satan is behind you in accusation and he wants you to be like this woman we just read about in the story. He wants you to be embarrassed and ashamed in the course of condemnation. And just like the women in the story, our acknowledged guilt leaves us powerless to silence our accusers. I mean, what am I going to say when my accusers start pointing out my sin? Because I can't even silence my own conscience at times. And we've all stood where she stood. And even though we've asked God to, to forgive us, the charges of our accusers rings loudly in their ears. But you need to understand that's not from God. When the memory and the pain of a sin in your past keeps coming up, keeps haunting you and keeps pulling you down, it's not from God. 
It's not from God because God is not going to haunt you with something he's already forgiven you for. It's not from God. It's coming from someone else. You see, our memories and our emotions make us vulnerable to assaults from the accuser. And that happens to all of us. You could be taking a shower. You could be driving down the road or cooking dinner. And suddenly, you're overwhelmed with a, a painful memory of things in your past. Things that you want to put back in the closet, but they keep coming out again. And they start to haunt you and you start to feel shame. So the question is, why does Satan bother to accuse us? Well, I want you to understand something. The accusation cannot affect your standing with God. If you're a Christian this morning, you're in Christ Jesus, and your sins will be forgiven, Satan can accuse all he wants. But he cannot change your relationship with God. I want you to understand that Satan accuses not because he believes he can steal your salvation. He accuses and condemns because he knows he can steal your joy in being a Christian. He knows he can feel your effectiveness of being a Christian. And that affects your witness. Uh, one of my favourite meals is steak with Diane sauce. We were just talking about this last night. I love Diane sauce. It's just wonderful. And I remember one time Fumi made, made me some. And some of the Diane sauce went over my shirt. And I, I was, wasn't very happy because it was one of my favourite shirts. Mm. But Fumi assured me, listen, I can, I can get that stain out, don't worry about it. She, she soaked it and she did all the things she knew what to do to get rid of the stain. And when she was through, she gave me the shirt back and it was almost invisible. The stain was almost invisible. I mean, you would really have to strain your eyes and look up close to make out a tiny ring where that stain was. And people would look at that shirt later and they wouldn't even know there was a stain there in the first place. But you know what the problem was? I knew it was there. I knew it was there. And I could see that stain from 10 yards away. And it was big. And it was bold. And it was ugly. And guess what? That shirt stayed in the closet. And you know what? That's what Satan is trying to do to you. Even though God has washed away your stain in the, uh, or your sins, Satan wants to come along and say, I can still see it. Can't you see it? Everybody can see it. That's what Satan wants to do. Because he wants you to stay in the closet. And that's why he accuses. And that's why he's not going to give up. So why shouldn't we just give in? <clears throat> well, I want to remind you of something. That you can't silence your accusers, but Jesus can. Notice, notice how quickly Jesus moved in to shield this accused woman from the accusing crowd. Notice that. What he does is he takes the attention off of her and puts the attention on himself. Which is exactly what he does every time Satan accuses us. Because if Satan is behind you in accusation, then Jesus is between you and condemnation. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, wait a minute. Well, have accusers spoke the truth? And aren't shame and, and condemnation the just consequences of sin? And this is very important. Jesus has got no intention of defending or excusing her sin. He's got no intention of excusing your sin. He doesn't even ask her side of the story. And she must have a side of the story. But I want to know where the guy is. If they were caught in the act of adultery, where's the guy in the story? But notice Jesus doesn't even get into that. He doesn't get into it at all. And so you might say, well, how can he show her mercy? If this woman who is justly condemned, how, how can he show mercy to her without contradicting God's justice? Well, the answer is quite simple. 
He can stand between her and condemnation because he was willing to pay her penalty. By his work on the cross, Jesus has forever condemned the spirit of condemnation. Now think about this for a moment. This woman, who came fully expecting to meet a judge, deserving to meet a judge, she left knowing a saviour. And so the question of the morning is this, will her story become your story? Because the only way I know to deal with accusation and, and to deal with the guilt is to understand the gospel of Jesus. You're going to have to know and believe with all your heart the good news concerning Jesus. And so point number one is this. Forgiveness is available because Jesus took my guilt and my shame upon himself. You see, condemnation does have grounds to assault us. Satan does have conclusive evidence that all of us have violated God's laws. When he accuses us of sin, he's not lying. He's the father of lies and he's good at it, but he's not lying. When it comes to make a, uh, making a case against me as a sinner, he's got evidence. Lots of evidence that I'm a sinner. But my defence lawyer, the Lord Jesus Christ, he doesn't plead extenuating circumstances. He doesn't argue for my innocence. Notice what he said here in Romans 3. Everyone has sinned and is far away from God's saving presence. But by the free gift of God's grace, all are put right with him through Jesus Christ who set them free. God offered him so that by his blood, he should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven. You see, the good news is that Jesus substituted his own sinless life for mine. And he took upon himself everything my sins deserve. Hebrews, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Notice, scorning its shame. And so when I say everything, I mean more than just the penalty of, your, uh, of death that your sins deserve. I mean Jesus took upon himself all the guilt and all the shame that your sins deserve. He took everything that is ugly. He took everything that is painful and, and, and shameful about your sin and he put it on himself. See, one thing what we've done is that we've so centralised the cross, we've almost emptied it of its meaning. The cross has just become something that people wear in their ear or a little necklace around their neck. But they've emptied it of its meaning. And you might be thinking, well, what's more shameful than standing in a bed sheet brought in in front of a courtroom uh, of men caught in adultery? Well, let me tell you what's more shameful. It's hanging naked on a piece of wood in front of the whole world, because that's what the cross was. You see these beautiful pictures of Jesus on the cross being crucified, yeah? And all of them, you see Jesus wearing a loincloth. That was not true. Criminals were, were, were naked. It was shameful. You see, Jesus didn't just take the penalty for your sin on the cross with him. He took all that guilt. He took all the shame that ever needs to accompany your sins upon himself on the cross. And then, if that's what he did, Satan wants to come along and whisper in your ear and say, yeah, Jesus paid the price for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the shame of it. And you're going to have to live with it all the days of your life. That's what Satan wants to do. But loved ones, don't let Satan tell you you own something if Jesus took it away. Let me illustrate to this week. Robert the Bruce. Is it there? Forward, oh, that's it. Robert the Bruce. He was a Scottish leader of the independence in the 14th century and he was being chased by the English. And the English were very clever. What they did, they got Bruce's own bloodhounds and set him on Bruce's trail to chase him and hunt him down. 
And as they were running away, he said that said, oh, we're done for. But Bruce says, look, everything's going to be all right. And so they ran into a forest. And Bruce found a stream. And they jumped in the stream and started going up it. And so when his own bloodhounds got to the stream, they obviously lost the scent because the water had washed it all away. And a few days later, the, the Scottish crown was on, on Bruce's head. Now, what Satan wants to do, Satan wants to send the blood towns of condemnation and accusation on your trail. That's what he wants to do. He wants to follow you all your life, barking and accusing and, and chasing. But loved ones, the blood of Jesus has washed it all away. It's washed it all away. There's nothing left for them to follow. And that's the truth that you need to believe today. Not just nod your head, but you need to believe it. Believe in your heart. His blood doesn't just wash away the record of your sin. It washes away the stain of your shame. That's hard to believe, isn't it? But the second part about the gospel is believable. Because it's based on his merit and not mine. You see, one reason that, that shame haunts us so much is that it's a struggle for us to accept the gospel of grace. <laughs> That's one reason why Christians, for just over 2,000 years, have been so vulnerable to legalism, to, to believing that we've got to do something to help God out, or to make a deal with God, or, or work something out so that we can deserve this incredible gift that God keeps talking about concerning heaven. And for just over 2,000 years of Christian history, legalism and judgmentalism have always gone together. Where there's a spirit of, of legalism, I've got to somehow earn my salvation, you will always find an increased spirit of accusation. Now why, what do people do who just can't accept grace? I'll tell you what to do. They start to bargain with God. And haven't you done that? Oh God, if you would just forgive that one sin, I promise I'll never miss church again. God, if you if you just cover that one sin up, I promise I'll even teach in a ladies' class or a men's class. I'll even teach with the kids. And a favourite one? Oh God, and I promise that I'll never ever do that again. And what happens when we do do it again? What happens to the shame factor? Now you may not see yourself this way. Because maybe, maybe most of your life you've attended worship and you've been a decent moral person. But you've got to see yourself right now like that woman covered in a bed sheet. Because that's who you are. She didn't have an offer to make Jesus. And you don't either. You don't have anything to offer God. You've got one hope, and that's to accept the offer that God has made. Ephesians says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. You see, salvation isn't based on your ability to improve yourself. So it's, it's based on the capacity of God keeping his promise. It's based on my capacity to trust in the promises of God, to trust in the merit of Jesus. You see, God paid the greatest price in eternity to make us this offer. And the price that God paid is a rebuttal to which your accuser has got no answer. You see, if, if salvation was up to me, then guilt and shame will be among my constant companions. And the voice of my accusers will be constantly ringing in my ears. But salvation is not up to me. As we just sang a moment ago, my hope is built on nothing less than what? Jesus' blood and righteousness. And then finally, number three. The gospel is reliable because it's been given by the one who's in authority. I think my favourite part of this story is the way the accusers bark down in the presence of Jesus. I love that. Now it's amazing, isn't it? How many people are ready 
to accuse. But what Jesus taught us in this story is that there's a whole load of people out there who are not qualified to condemn anybody. And yet they're ready to do it, right? <laughs> and the only man who ever lived who is qualified to condemn, he doesn't even do it. He doesn't even accuse the accusers. You see, he stands between me and condemnation. And did you know that every time the accuser speaks against me, that Jesus stands to defend me? He's got something to say that such a, shuts the accuser up. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died? More than that, who was raised to life and is at the right hand of God. And what is he doing? He's interceding for us. Do you understand what Paul is saying here? Paul is saying this. Satan says, I'm guilty. Jesus says, it's paid for. That's what he's saying. So you've got to ask yourself, whose testimony are you going to let carry the most weight in your life? Because I've got to tell you, loved ones, I believe in letting Jesus take the floor when he starts to speak. I wonder... When Jesus said to the woman, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. I wonder for the very first time in her life, she included herself. He totally silenced her accusers. And loved ones, he wants to do the same for us. You see, when the voice of accusation begins to point its finger towards you, you've got to ask yourself, who am I going to listen to? Who's got the answer for the spirit of condemnation? And so what we really need to do as Christians, we need to listen to what God is saying in his word. Things like, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our trespasses from us. Do you believe that? Or what about, I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Do you include yourself in that? In your sins? Here's what I want you to think about as we close. I want you to decide today that you're going to refuse to let the voice of the accuser drown out the promise of a saviour. I want you to tell yourself that you're not going to live your life in a closet anymore. I want you to tell yourself that you're not going to let your life be weighed down by the very things that Jesus took with him on the cross. And if you're a Christian this morning and you're struggling with guilt, and you're struggling with shame, now let me encourage you to focus your eyes back on Jesus and remember why you became a Christian in the first place. And if you're not a Christian this morning, then you need to go to the cross and do business with Jesus himself. You need to allow him to pay the price for your sin. God bless.